Hey guys, welcome to my new YouTube channel, Player Input. I created this channel to allow tennis professionals to voice their opinions and express their feelings in regards to the ATP, WTA, and ITF associations behind the scenes. Now more than ever, I feel like it's time to come together and buckle down on the flaws that are on the tour. Today on episode one of Player Input, I'm calling a good friend of mine, Tara Moore, who is uh, a British tennis player who was born and raised in Hong Kong. She's 27 years old. Her current ranking in singles is 447 and her current ranking in doubles is 234. I feel as though this would be a good first call and first episode because as Tara is running for the ITF Player Council, I feel as though she has the most information when it comes to the ATP, WTA and ITF tours uh, at the present moment, especially during this pandemic. So I feel like uh, this episode will provide everyone with much information that they haven't received yet. Hey Tara, what's up? Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm good, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for joining today in this new episode of uh, Player Input. No worries. I'm happy to be here. All right, good. All right, well, I just want to get straight into, um, you know, a little bit of a personal details when it comes to you before we get anything specific when it comes to the, to the tour. But can you just okay. explain um, what got you into tennis, how you started tennis, kind of like a little childhood memory and all that? long story um so basically when I was around seven I started to play tennis at my local park and and my uncle was really into it and my mum too they used to watch a lot of tennis uh when they were younger and when I was like younger too so they took me to a local park and and just got me into it and my uncle worked across the road from a tennis club so he got me a membership for my seventh birthday so I started <laughs> playing like that Nice. Um, it wasn't anything serious in the beginning, just like kind of once or twice a week, you know, just for a little bit of exercise here and there. But um, eventually got better at it and um, a scout from Boletari came over to Hong Kong and, and kind of took me over to America when I was around 10. So that's how I started getting really into tennis. Wow, that's pretty cool. What a cool story. <laughs> All right. Um, so... Now on the term of tennis, uh, where are you right now? Where are you based right now? Um, so currently I've been in uh, the States. I've been kind of in Michigan a lot, like training out here. Um, I'm with Amina, my partner, yeah. who I play doubles with a lot as well. So we're, we're out here training. And yeah, it's been really nice to have sort of like a steady base and, and somewhere to train out of, especially during these times anyways. <laughs> and, and have you been able to train during this pandemic or what's happening? Um, yeah, we've been pretty lucky. There's been like a couple of courts here and there that have just kind of kept open. So we've been um, able to train with each other because obviously like we're from the same household. So it, it's good. been pretty controlled and, and, and safe. But um, we've, yeah, we've been pretty lucky with that. Wow, that's super lucky. Yeah, I haven't been, been able to play much here. We've been on lockdown. Um, yeah, I know. A lot of players haven't been able to train at all. So. Yeah, around the world. I, it's crazy. Yeah, no, that's super lucky of you to, to have any... Yeah. Uh, ability well, to had, train. Um, I had shoulder surgery probably like the day before lockdown as Oof. well, so I kind of had like <laughs> the perfect timing for everything for me. Yeah. So like I had three weeks kind of just rehab and, and everything like that trying to get back into it, but now obviously all healed up so I can start training again, which is really good. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm glad you're healing. And and income wise, like what obviously no one has been able to, to play any tournaments and according to the ITF, it won't be open till July. so. I know you've been uh, telling me that you've been teaching some, is that true? Yeah, so like the, now that the government have kind of uh, taken some restrictions um, down to another threat level, so they've obviously opened up a lot of golf course and tennis courses, we're allowed to sort of hit with people outside of our household, so it's been kind of good to see different faces and, and be able to, to coach a little bit and, and help out the local kids out here and, and just kind of of them a little bit of insight from like a, a touring professional i guess <laughs> that's good yeah i mean yeah no of course that anything uh, anyone will take anything i've i've taught around uh, a couple times so i know exactly what you're talking about but no that's yeah. good at least you can do something and and that's really good that in michigan uh you know you have more ability to do things because around the world people can't do anything yeah for sure i think it's it's been really tough on a lot of tennis players being cooped up in the house especially because we're so used to traveling around the world and being outside like almost 24 7 so. yeah no i had a rough time in the beginning i wasn't able to sleep for a while so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too much energy too much energy yeah no it's it's a grind man it's a grind and uh coming off of that what are your biggest challenges on tour personally for you 
Um, you know, for me, like I've been on the tour for so long, it's probably been around 12 to 14 years now that I've been playing professional tennis. So it's been a very long time. I, I, I didn't go to college or anything like that. I went professional straight after sort of coming out of the junior circuit. So I've been around for a really long time and, and just trying to keep the passion and, and fire for, for tennis ignited because obviously like playing tennis is it's there are a lot of there's obviously a lot of great stuff but there's also as you know as a tennis player as well there's a lot of things that aren't as glamorous and aren't as um, lovely as they seem <laughs> um so just trying to keep that like passion going and, and still try to find what i love about tennis every day and, and just enjoying it really that's the main challenge i think yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It's uh, you know I've been in and out of out of the tour also, so I know what you mean. But that love and that desire never goes away for me, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah, I think there's always some part, like some aspect that we we just miss when we're away from it. Whether it's the traveling, right. whether it's the camaraderie, whether whether it's like the the competing aspect of it. But, but there's always a part that like you really love, and and that's kind of the the thing that you have to focus on when whenever you're in sort of a a bad situation or a bad sort of, I don't know, a win-loss period in your career. I think you just have to really look for the positives and, yeah, try and look for the good stuff. No, oh, yeah, I completely agree. It's easy to get bottled up in the negative when, when it's your only livelihood and, and you've been on the road for three months and you have two more months to go. I, I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so uh, based off the biggest challenges, um, I've told uh, the crowd here that you're running for the ITF Council. If you can just explain a little bit to me and to them um, what what that is exactly, because not even myself, I don't know much about it. Yeah, so basically um, after a very long and lengthy campaign by a couple players who, who've just been pushing for a louder voice within tennis, um, especially like the WTA and the ATP, they have sort of a couple members um, of like the tennis community that are able to sit on a council or a board kind of thing to, to give input and, and basically voice concerns about the players and uh, what like the players have and stuff like that about the tour. So they've the ITF have kind of uh, been lagging behind this for a couple of years now and, and they finally listen to um, a lot of players, you know, asking for a bit more information and a bit more power within what we can like do on the tour basically because for, for so many years like it, even now like we're, a lot of players like yourself like you just said we just don't know what's going on with the tour yeah, so never. I think with the ITF council I think it's important to um, have people on the council that are able to express your views as, as a player um, and also you know find the right things to say and, and, and fight and advocate for because I think um, you know, there's a lot of things that we want to change on that tour, but a lot of things aren't realistic. And I think um, being able to fight for the things that we really can change and that really will make a difference on a tour rather than just trying to fight, you know, little battles. It's kind of like fighting the uh, war, like winning the war rather than like winning all the little battles because I think there will be a lot of little battles with the ITF that we, we probably won't win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to put myself up for election just because I think I have a very outspoken nature and I'm, I'm not afraid of speaking up and, and kind of ruffling feathers so I think I could really help players have a voice and have a say in what goes on behind the scenes of the tour. Yeah for sure and I think you're very you know having you since you've been uh, competing for 10 to 12 years now obviously you have some knowledge of the tour uh, from the Grand Slam level all the way to the 15,000 level so you know, we need someone like you that, that's on there that knows each level because people only see sometimes the 15K level and then people only see the Grand Slam level. They don't really know how, how the transition works and it's not easy. But um, yeah. on, it's I mean, sad to say, but do you think the pandemic um, brought, brought this council together or was this being um, voiced before? Um, it definitely was voiced before. I think the pandemic kind of Pushed gave it. every yeah everyone a kind of period of time to put everything together and, and put a lot of the logistics into place. And obviously now a lot of players are kind of sat at home twiddling their thumbs, so <laughs> they don't have much time. Like I mean, they have so much time that they don't really know what to do with it. So right. I think they are, are definitely giving a lot more thought into what kind of tour we are traveling on. And I think a lot of people aren't happy with with the way that we're treated as players and, and it's kind of it's sad because 
it's sort of like we're not thought of as a necessity on a tour that is very player based right. which doesn't make any sense um, so I think that if we can somehow show that we're all united and we, we're trying to fight for one um, you know we all have one specific goal in mind I feel like that would be, make us a lot stronger and, and, and give us a, a very strong standing point 100% because I feel like tennis is such an independent sport but at the same time it's something that is created because of all of us but no one sees right. it that way yeah and and what are some of the changes that you'd like to see on the tour if you were elected for me i would like to see a lot more transparency between the tours and, and sort of the players because right now they don't really tell us what's happening or what they're trying to change as we saw with the itf transition tour last year how you know 90 percent of the players were unhappy with the changes that were made to the tour and i think that's kind of the thing that will keep happening if players aren't able to voice their concerns and voice their opinions um, I think that's probably the main change that, that can just be fixed with, with simple you know, weekly updates um, different kinds of, of feedback and communication, surveys being sent out, questions asked to players and, and actually listening to them and taking on board kind of what we have as feedback because obviously we're the one that's living it, we're the one that, mm -hmm. that that are in the situations where the ones that are playing the tournaments, if if we have these concerns, obviously they're legitimate and we should be able to somehow feed that back to the ITF and, and have them listen to every single concern and, and at least at least prioritize them with, with the amount of, of feedback they get on each thing. You know, because right now there's no way that, like, you as a player, like, let me ask you this question, do you even know how to ask a question to the ITF or, or raise a concern like it, it, it seems like such a difficult process no yeah no I mean uh, you know I usually if I have any questions in regards to anything I go on the WTA website and I just look for whatever email is there right it's nothing it's specific not, it's or like, anything like yeah. that exactly and I just think that I think that needs to be changed even within the WTA they obviously have a council but and they have council members on there but they're not very accessible they're not mm -hmm. You know they don't have their numbers given on their as their, their, their players as well and, and they probably don't want to be bothered by a lot of things which i understand you know that they have their own business too but i do think if you're up for a council member position and, and you're representing the players you need to be accessible you need to be as open as possible and you need to be giving out your numbers to players or uh, at least an email contact where people can say hey look i don't understand this about um the tour can you please explain it to me and and, and it should, and this kind of feedback should be greeted with, with great, I'm so happy that you want to know more about the tour. And right now I feel like there's a lot of pushback on that and it, it's not the, the kind of um, feedback that we get from the council members. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I've been playing, I've been competing on the tour since I was 15, 16 years old and I, I can tell you I barely know anything about the tour. I just go out and play. <laughs> so if anything were to happen, yeah, and anything changes, I, I don't even, you know, I don't even look it up because I don't even want to be bothered with that. I'm so focused on competing, you know, but obviously for a lot of people, the changes that they make are very severe. And, and like you said, that ITF transition tour. I, I, I hadn't played um, for a year before they came out with that. So when I did come back to tour on the tour, I was in that transition tour thing going on. And I didn't even know anything about it. And, and it was it was very difficult for people who were just starting out playing pro to, to get to the level that, that they deserved to get to or they wanted to get to. And, and I'm glad that they changed it back to the normal way that everyone was used to because that was, that was crazy. Yeah, like for college players, it was so tough to come out of college and, and start from, you know. To do anything. It was anything. almost like, yeah, it was like starting almost below zero. Yeah, like below. Starting from like, yeah, starting from a very compromised position. I feel like it, it, that, that was something that could have been avoided with, with if there was a council already formed back then. So let's say two years ago when, they, when this idea sort of was forming. Um, I think this, would have, this wouldn't have happened. And the same thing with, with sort of the super tie break for, for the third set yeah. in qualifying matches I feel like that has made so many players unhappy and, and it's something that a simple survey or questionnaire that's sent out by the ITF could, could fix and solve, you know, you, we could play a short set to four instead uh, yeah. which which probably takes a similar amount of time, you know, 25 minutes and to it's play more fair. a 10 point tie break yeah, and it's, it, you can play yourself into it, you have more rhythm and a lot of the times 10 point tie breaks are just Luck. It was lucky. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think 
it, it's it's something that really needs to be looked at as well. Um, that's another thing that I'd really like to change, and it's something that we can change very quickly and, and, and simply as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, some of the changes that they make, I don't even know how they come about it, to be honest, because. Yeah. You know, like you said, before before this player council was even created or an idea, I don't know who they went to to get these ideas from. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of the board members, I mean, I've been reading up on it, obviously, Mary Pierce is and, and it's sitting on the board, and obviously, Mark Woodford as well, and they obviously are ex-tennis players, so I think they were trying to find a way to shorten matches so that we would be less tired going forward into main draw, but it, it's kind of worked against the whole system mm -hmm. in a way, because a lot of tournaments now have started to play two qualifying matches in one day because they, they see that we're not playing full three set matches so they're like okay we should take full advantage of this and put two matches in one day and yeah. finish okay. qualifying by Monday <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. but that's not the, the, the case you know players need to not only physically recover from a, a, a two set let alone like how sometimes two sets are, are very long you know they could be oh, over 100%. two hours Especially your matches, Cam. Yeah, no, I mean, I was just about to say, I'm, I'm competing in this um, UTR tennis series that's on ESPN right now in uh, in Tampa, in Saddlebrook, and it's two matches a day. And I played, and with a uh, third set 10-point tiebreaker, I played two third set tiebreakers in a row in the same day, and I had to ask my wife to take off my shoes, please, because I was cramping, <laughs> and I couldn't, yeah. because both of my, two set, uh, my third set tiebreakers took two hours. I was dying. That's exactly. So it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, little little things like this, this is what I want to make a change on. Things that, that don't seem so uh, big uh, logistic-wise for the ITF to change or a tournament to change, it, it's a big difference for it players. Is. And I think that's one thing that I really want to come in and change. The things that I can instantly come in and make an impact on, the things that can easily change, I think those are the main things that we should step up and voice our opinion on first before we start talking and, and disputing and, and arguing about, you know, big stuff, sort of, sort of obviously pay-wise and, and how we get paid and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, that's a big, much bigger conversation. Like, the, the little things that I want to come in and change first, they'll, they'll make a big difference quickly and, and it will take no time at all it, to implement. Like, if they came in tomorrow and just said, okay, instead of playing 10-point tiebreakers after the after the coronavirus break, we're all going to play a third set, to, a short set to four. If it's three all, you play a tiebreak. But like, I think all players would be like, okay, great. And, you know, another rule, you're only allowed to play one singles match per day, yeah. one singles, one doubles per day, maximum. Unless it's rain, obviously. Yeah. That's a different story. But I think all players would be happy with that. And, and that's one thing that I've heard a lot of feedback from players on, you know, countless players have told me this is the one thing I really want you to come change this is the one thing I want to be changed so yeah I think just listening to all the players and, and trying to put a lot of ideas together that I can put forward to the ITF council if I get that that chance obviously yeah 100, no, I 100% agree with what you're saying and and since since you and your wife are both players on the tour obviously does it make you more motivated to run for council and to see a change in, in the, on the tour or because like me I I'm married to someone who, who is not sports related whatsoever, but I do want to see the changes. But I, I'm assuming that since you and your wife are both players, it means even more to you. Yeah, I think obviously watching Amina play, and, and it's it's been a struggle obviously for her too, being on the same kind of tour level that I am. I think, hmm. you know, regardless of, of Amina's status or my status, I think regardless of our rankings whatever happens to my ranking whether i you know make it or not i'd always want to advocate a better playing field for all all players and all ranks you know I, I can't just say that like obviously i haven't seen every single side of the tennis tour right. it's impossible to see every single side but i'm pretty sure i have witnessed most of them um and i can i can speak from most perspectives and and i I'm trying to gather the information from every player mm -hmm. uh, rather than just going on my own experiences. I want to know everyone's story. I want to know what they find tough in their own situation as well. And, and the more information I gather from each player in their own individual situation, the more information and feedback I can give to the ITF. So it, it doesn't really matter what Amina and I do within tennis. I think for me, even when I stop playing tennis, I'll never stop advocating for a better playing ground for tennis players in general. Yeah, to not go through what we went through with what we're dealing with, I guess. Right. 
right I, I don't want the next generation to to think oh you know what tennis isn't a sport for me to earn a living with I think if you're talented and you're able to play tennis and travel the world and, and, and have a ranking I feel like you should at least be able to break even yeah you know that, that's it's just I, I, I don't know like that's just my feeling and, and I've had a lot of negative feedback with this opinion on social media from from people saying if you don't break even why don't you just quit and, and go get a normal job yeah, because you're trying for your life to make it. I mean, right. <laughs> you know. So the fact is, is they don't they don't see the, the fact that we do have a normal job behind the scenes. So many players, you know, ranked three hundred and below, have coaching jobs, play club matches. They they work maybe in their family business. They do have other jobs. We are doing that, but we also have a a, a full time job playing mm-hmm. tennis as well. We train for six to eight hours a day we eat we have to eat in a certain way we have to mm-hmm. sleep in a certain way we have to recover in a certain way we sacrifice um, seeing our friends we sacrifice especially when life. we're younger yeah. right when you're younger you, you 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 don't see your friends as much you don't go out and party you, you know all of this stuff that that i guess if you have a normal job you might not need to sacrifice as much i'm not saying i'm not saying that they aren't important and I'm not saying they're not hard I'm just saying there's a lot of things that we have to sacrifice as sports people that if you had a normal job you probably wouldn't need to sacrifice as much yeah I mean I live by that I I, you know I do work when I'm not uh, when I'm not traveling for tournaments because there is a life after tennis and tennis you know until a certain ranking you can only bring so much so you know you need to think about the bills you have to pay uh, for the future, exactly. how much time do you have? How old are you? What What are you thinking about uh, doing in in a certain amount of years? And you know, so it's it's people only see tennis as you know you you make it or you don't. But there's a life afterwards. So I feel like a lot of people don't don't realize that. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I've, what I've always said is that I've pretty much been working since I was ten years old. I, you know, when I was ten years old, I was training almost eight, nine hours a day. Yeah, like my mum would make me train at an academy or even with her or with the ball machine for, for up to eight, nine hours a day. Uh, and I've been working since almost without days off since yeah. I was 10 years old until now. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, let's say I retire in the next year or so. After I retire, it's not something I'm going to have a pension. I'm not going to have anything to fall back on. I'll have to go and, and go coach until I'm... For years. Again, <laughs> yeah, until I'm again you know, at retirement age for a normal job. Right. So it's almost like... Or even more because money. because you've been spending money all these years and, and, you know, from 10 to 18, unless you've been working, you don't really make money because you're playing juniors. Yeah. So you're probably going to have to work some people even past normal average retirement age. Yeah, for sure. I, I completely agree with that. I think, uh, again, it's a great life and, and a lot of people... It, see a lot of glamorous sides to it but there is a side that isn't as glamorous and these sides are essential for the tour to keep continuing to grow and, and if you like watching top the top players play and, and you like watching those tournaments it's essential for those lower ranked levels to keep alive because they are at the future they, they are the people that will feed up into those top uh, tournaments they will be the ones that are playing the grand slams in the next couple of years hopefully mm-hmm. you know it's very rare that you see someone go from no ranking to to top 10 right. you know in in the space of three months they normally build the way up they start at, from nothing they go to 500 they go to 200 they go to top 100 and so on and so forth so i think it's important to understand that the lower levels are very important for the top levels extremely to important it's the it's the base it's the base that's how you build right all right last question how do you think tennis is going to change after this pandemic, what do you think? Because right now, um, where I'm competing, uh, each player has their own can of balls with their initials on it. So um, each player serves with their own balls and all that. Unless you agree to, to use all six balls, uh, you use your own balls. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to continue afterwards or what the measures are going to be. What do you think? Um, in that sense, for, for safety measures, I think it will be very hard for the sport to continue internationally the rest mm-hmm. of this year uh, I definitely my personal opinion is and I'm probably wrong but <laughs> I just don't think international travel is safe 
Yeah, uh, I, I think the safety of, of players and the organizers and the people that are involved in, in creating and putting on tennis events is the, is, should be the number one priority. And I think until this is guaranteed and, and the virus is not being so widespread, I think that it's going to be very hard for tennis to continue internationally. I think what they're doing at Salabrook right now is really cool. It's, it's something unique and it's great to bring tennis back to, to TVs and stuff. But mm-hmm. I, I, I find it very hard to imagine international tennis being played the rest of 2020. Agreed, yeah. I think, especially because uh, my, my thought is, or my assumption, um, according to all the research and scientists and news is that you know once everything officially reopens around the world there's a high chance of a second spike you know so I think that second spike is gonna come during the time where the ITF and, and the ATP and the WTA are trying to reopen so I think that's gonna shut it down until 2021 yeah and a, and a lot of players are gonna be afraid they, yeah we're obviously young and healthy and, and maybe stronger and less uh our, our symptoms could be less severe but we also have parents we have grandparents mm-hmm. and we don't want to jeopardize their lives as mm-hmm. well you know traveling from i don't know one side of the country and then coming home and it, how would that work would you quarantine yourself in your room for 14 days like you're going to have to come in contact with with at least some people from your family if you're living at home which most players are um, so it's just going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen and and i i hope that tennis can start at the beginning of 2021 but we have to be realistic and and uh yeah cautiously optimistic let's say okay well that's all i got for you anything else <laughs> no that's great Thanks it's for good to me. yeah thank you so much Tara. i really appreciate it no worries thank you all right we'll talk soon all right bye-bye. bye bye all right guys that's it for episode one i hope you really enjoyed uh the chat that i had with tara and we'll tune in and see who our next guest will be for episode two thank you so much